All right, thanks, Julia. So as Julia mentioned, I have this, this, there's this term that floats around my lab, and that is evolutionary synthetic biology, okay? And that's kind of a, a nebulous term, I admit, to most people. And what we try to do is we're trying to develop what I would argue is a particular research paradigm whereby you're combining evolutionary biology and synthetic biology, and neither one of them has more say on the, in terms of the other in terms of influence. So we're not using necessarily synthetic biology to understand evolution, and we're not just exploiting evolutionary models to do synthetic biology. It's really kind of this, this um, circular paradigm where we're using evolutionary principles to model and develop engineered proteins and engineered organisms even, potentially. And on the flip side, we're generating synthetic molecules and using these to enhance our understanding of evolutionary principles as well as using these synthetic molecules for industrial and biomedical purposes. Now, as um, Julia mentioned, so we've been fortunate that we've, we've been able to publish a lot in the five years since I, I started my lab. And we have about 20 publications now. And because of that, I can't really go through all of the research topics associated with those publications. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to pick out a couple of examples and walk you through those kind of rapidly um, and, and maybe even bypass some of the finer details associated with those. Um, and I actually, so I have this terrible habit of trying to convey too much information when I, when I give lectures, and, and I think this is probably going to do the same today. Um, so just be forewarned. Um, just to give you perspective, though, this, uh, I'm going to show an outline. This is the last time I'm going to show this outline. But as I transition between research topics, what I'm going to do, the color of the slides are going to change. So you can kind of visually reset your brain as I'm talking about something new. So I'm going to, talk, I'm going to introduce, though, this notion of ancestral sequence reconstruction and how we perform it. And then I'm going to give three examples. The first example is how can we can extend ancestral sequence reconstruction, or ASR, to understand adaptation. And, and we, we have a test case where we use ex well, something called experimental evolution. And then what I'll do is I'll talk about another example where this issue associated with, well, when we infer ancestral sequences, how can we be confident that we're actually inferring the correct ancestral sequence? And so I'll talk about this experimental phylogeny that we've developed in the lab that allows us to benchmark ancestral sequence reconstruction methods. And then lastly, I'll just kind of briefly end with how we can exploit ancient proteins and extend them beyond helping our understanding of evolution to a therapeutic value associated with those ancestral proteins. How can we extend this notion of an evolutionary protein into the clinic to help human patients? Okay, so um, I guess I'm, I'm going to start off with today just to kind of ground everyone. So kind of at the core of what we do is molecular evolution and phylogenetics. Almost all of the analyses that we do for the most part involve some sort of phylogenetics where we collect sequences and we build phylogenetic trees to understand the relationships of the sequences or the organisms from which those sequences come. So here we have the classic, what's often called the universal tree of life. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny. So. Um, you know, I typically, I tell my students that it's, it's certainly presumptuous to think that this is the universal tree of life, right? If you were to find organisms in a different galaxy or solar system, are they going to connect to this tree? Probably not, but maybe. Um, but up really, <laughs> jokingly, until today I would have said, well, no, there's no way it's going to connect to this tree. But as a student in my lab just pointed out earlier this morning, my PhD advisor is actually plastered all over the internet today because he has come up with what he argues is a plausible chemical route for the origins of life. Okay? The kicker, though, is that that plausible chemical mechanism for the origin of life could have only taken place on Mars. It could not have taken place on Earth. All right? So what that argues for potentially is this notion of panspermia, where maybe life started on a different planet and then it traveled to, to Earth. But I'm, I'm not going to talk about that today. Just kind of a nice little sidebar. So, at the core of what we do, we have these phylogenetic trees. These trees help us understand how organisms adapt and change, what their relationships are, et cetera. And in this case here, what we're, what we're highlighting is if you have a red branch on this tree, you are what's called a hyperthermophilic organism. Okay? So the organisms that are at the tips of the red branches are hypothermophiles. These are organisms that grow in very, very hot environments. And so based on the connectivity and branching of this tree, 
it's been estimated that the last common ancestor of life would have been one of these hyperthermophiles, or maybe even the last common ancestor of bacteria was a hyperthermophile. Okay? Now, oops, sorry. So, typically, these types of questions are often answered by either chemists or geologists. Very rarely are they offered by or, or addressed by biologists, and certainly not experimental biologists. Some computational biologists will try to address these questions, but not experimental biologists. And so, this is where we want to come in. We want to be able to say, well, what types of evolutionary models can we exploit to be able to understand from an experimental standpoint what was going on with early life? And so that's where this notion of ancestral sequence reconstruction comes into play. To walk you through this process, so here's the, one of the first steps that we do for ancestral sequence reconstruction is we collect a bunch of sequences from modern organisms, okay? So these are going to be orthologous or paralogous sequences. So fundamentally, though, they're homologous sequences, meaning they share a common ancestor. And so we collect a bunch of sequences and we build a phylogenetic tree for those sequences, based on those sequences. And that will tell us the relationships of these sequences. And in each one of the nodes here, so these are called nodes within this tree, and so these are branching points, are oftentimes associated with speciation events in terms of the biological history of this gene family or these species. And what we can do is we can infer what the ancient sequences are at the particular nodes of that tree there, okay? So it's not the sequences at the tips of the tree, it's going to be the sequences that are at the nodes of the tree, okay? And so we have various algorithms. I'm not really going to get into the detail of the different algorithms that we can use to infer ancient sequences. Just know that there's actually, there's a number of algorithms available to researchers, but that we don't necessarily know which algorithms work the best, right, because we can't test we can't benchmark the algorithms because we don't know the past. Okay? Anyways, we can use the algorithms, we can infer the ancestral sequences, we'll get a sequence from this analysis, okay? We can then actually build that sequence in the laboratory. So we will build an ancient sequence in the laboratory, and we'll use some maybe PCR. Actually, nowadays what we do is we pick up the phone or we dial up on our keyboard to a company, we'll tell them what sequence we want, and the company will synthesize the gene for us. At some point, we have a gene that represents an ancestral protein, okay? We'll then take that gene and we'll recombinantly express it in a modern organism. We could also use a in vitro translation system systems to express these ancient genes. Once we use the modern organism to express the ancient gene, we'll then purify the gene, and then we'll measure some property associated with that ancient gene. So one of the first gene families that I worked on right when I was, uh, right before I came to Georgia Tech was a gene family called Elongation Factor TU. Um, I guess I don't really need to get into all of this. Just know that uh, EFTU is a very important protein in terms of protein translation. It's a highly abundant, one of the most abundant proteins available in cells. And what's nice about this in terms of our studies is that there's this linear correlation between the optimal binding temperature of EF proteins compared to the optimal growth temperature from which that protein comes, okay? So meaning, if your EF protein is stable up to 80 degrees Celsius, it comes from an organism that will optimally grow at around 80 degrees Celsius, okay? And so there's this well-known linear correlation between some globular proteins um, and, and the optimal growth temperature of those globular proteins, EF happens to be one of those globular proteins. And this is actually work done by Michael Gromio, who's a visiting scientist in my lab a couple years ago. So in this sense, then, EFTU acts as a molecular thermometer. Okay? So we collect a bunch of EF sequences. We build one of these phylogenetic trees. We infer the ancestral sequences at each one of the nodes on that tree. And what's shown with the arrows on this tree are the nodes that we resurrected the gene sequences and expressed the recombinant ancient protein in the laboratory. And the temperature next to the arrows represents the melting temperature associated with those proteins based on uh, circular dichroism analyses, right, where we're just watching the protein unfold across a range of temperatures. So without getting into a lot of the details associated with this, what you see here is that there's a wide variety of temperatures associated with the ancient proteins. Okay? 
But, and what you also notice kind of is the further back in time you go, so this is the last common ancestor for this tree. This is all bacteria. It's rooted with archaea and eukaryotes down here. So for the last common ancestor of bacteria, this is one of the most thermostable proteins on that tree. Right? So what we did then is we compared these results to what's known in the geologic record in order to get a better understanding of how life may have evolved on early Earth. And the, First, let me show you, though, what are some estimates associated for the ancient ocean temperatures, geologic estimates. So on the x-axis here, we have uh, time in giga years or billions of years. So here's today. Here's four billion years ago. On the y-axis, we have temperature. So this is geologic evidence that estimates the ancient ocean temperature based on isotopic fractionation. So these are two different studies that looked at two different isotopes. They got very similar answers. And what you see here is that the further back in time you go, the more hot the ancient ocean was on Earth. Right? What we can do is we can overlay our data onto this tree here, whereby we can utilize what's called molecular dates or, or molecular clocks to be able to date the particular nodes in our phylogenetic tree. And when we do that here, so this represents one protein, one ancestral protein. This is the variance associated with our molecular clock estimates. And we can plot this then as a function of time and temperature based on our proteins. And what you see here is this very similar relationship whereby the further back in time you go, the more thermostable or more heat loving in terms of the proteins, is, and that correlates well with the estimates of the ancient ocean temperature. And I don't want to get into details about what's going on here, but there's a very good reason to believe that the ancient ocean was a constant temperature not like it is today where you have a lot of variability associated with that temperature. Okay, so um, since coming to Georgia Tech, we've actually extended these studies. I'm not going to go into them. We have collaborators where we're looking at other gene families as well, gene families that are, um, ha uh, provide clues as to ancient, uh, ancient temperatures, as well as a gene family that provides clues to the ancient pH associated with early life. And the consensus from these studies is that we, we believe that early life on Earth lived in a, in a hot, acidic environment. All right? And this would have been about three and a half to four billion years ago. All right? and we have this nice data that are converging with geologic evidence that points to a particular type of environment that hosted early life on Earth. Okay. So next what I want to do is I want to, I want to sh tell you how we've been able to extend some of these studies. And in this case with the EFTU, what we've done is we've done some experimental evolution work, but before I want to explain that, I need to provide some perspective to you in terms of the molecular details about EFTU. So EFTU is a GTPase, and as I mentioned, it's involved in protein translation. Specifically, what it does is it will bind to amino acyl tRNAs, and will carry those charged tRNAs to the ribosome. When the correct codon anti codon base pairing takes place between the tRNA and the messenger RNA, you will get hydrolysis of the GTP. And then that causes a conformational shift in the EFTU molecule, thereby releasing the complex from the ribosome where you have the EFTU and the spent nucleotide. Okay? And that process will then proceed after a nucleotide exchange factor kicks out the GDP and replaces it with a GTP. Okay? Fundamentally know then that this EFTU molecule has to interact with all of the tRNAs inside of a cell except for selenocysteine and pyrolysine. Um, so it has a, a very broad range in terms of, of, of specificity and its binding capacity. It's got to bind a lot of ancillary partners. Okay. So that, that led us to a particular project um, where we were interested in being able to manipulate components of the protein translation system in order to get synthesis of peptides or amino acids that in incorporate unnatural amino acids, okay? Not natural amino acids, unnatural amino acids. But we're not doing this chemically through chemical synthesis or solid phase synthesis. We're trying to exploit components of life to be able to incorporate unnatural amino acids during protein translation. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into this, but I've had some great students working on this. Megan Cole, who's now a faculty member at Emory, 
Vanessa Cox is in the audience here, Kelsey Grammer, a petite scholar that worked in the lab. And what they did is they've been exploiting the system that was developed by Yuida and colleagues in Japan. And it's called the PURE system. And what the PURE system stands for is protein synthesis using recombinant elements. So what these researchers did is they recombinantly expressed and purified all the components of the protein translation system from E. coli, except for ribosomes. So they will purify ribosomes as whole components out of E. coli. But all the other components of translation, the initiation factors, the elongation factors, the, the termination factors, et cetera, all those have been individually purified. And, and, and it allows you then, right, so you're going to have like 60 components of translation. What you can do is you can individually mix and match these components during translation to, um, to give you control over the different components of the system. Okay, so all of these components, now some of these don't have to write, so you can just buy ADP. You don't have to purify that out of E. coli. But all the other proteins have been purified individually out of E. coli so you can mix and match components. So what that allows you to do then is you can test recombinant version, right? So if you're going to make a protein translation factor, a recombinant protein translation factor, you can put it into this system and see how well it delivers amino acylated tRNAs to the ribosome. Okay? And so that's what um, some people in my lab do. Now, on the flip side is we have, so currently this technology developed by Yuda in Japan, it's licensed by New England Biolabs. And so they sell that. You can call up New England Biolabs and order this kit right here based on E. coli components. And at the time, what New England Biolabs was doing is they started developing a similar kit for Thermus aquaticus, or actually Thermus thermophilus. And they contacted us because they wanted to they wanted to test the ability of the, our ancient elongation factors to work in different systems. And in particular, they wanted to test so a pure system based on E. coli components or a pure system based on thermos components and test the interchangeability of our ancient proteins in those systems. Okay, so I'm just going to show you um, in one direction of those tests right here, whereby we're looking at the synthesis. So this isn't a test tube, right? This is a recombinant in vitro translation in a test tube. We're looking at synthesis of a GFP reporter, and we're doing it at 37 degrees where all the components of the translation system were isolated from E. coli. Okay. And so as you would expect, so we have different controls here, so when we don't add mRNA, we don't get translation. We don't add ribosome, we don't get translation. But we add all the components that we expect, including the E. coli EFTU, we get translation occurs. Okay. So notice though, what happens if, so here's thermos. Okay, so this is the thermos EFTU. You can't really see this because this is out of focus. Um, so here's thermos. When you put in the thermos EFTU, you only get about 33% of translation. Okay. So it, it suggests then that you do have some, what, what you would argue is functional equivalency between E. coli and thermos, right? You can take a thermos protein, throw it into a system whereby it has to at, interact with a different components from E. coli, and it will actually work. It won't work great, but it will work nonetheless. Okay? Now what's interesting about this system is you'll notice then that if you traverse the evolutionary path from thermos up to E. coli, which is up here, all of these ancient proteins work. Okay? And they work with varying degrees of, of um, efficiency. And in fact, maybe as you'd expect, the closer you get to E. coli in terms of ancient proteins, the better that ancient protein works. Now what's interesting though is as soon as you step outside of the evolutionary path that connects thermos to E. coli, A, the ancient protein doesn't work, and B, orthologous proteins from different species don't work. Okay? So here we have a species, so this is thermotoga, which is a thermophile, just similar to thermos here. This protein, EFTU from Thermotoga, doesn't work. Okay? It's interesting. This protein, EFTU from Thermotoga, is not functionally equivalent or functionally similar to what's going on in E. coli. Okay? Now, maybe in Thermotoga, it brings amino acylated tRNAs to the ribosome, but it's not doing it in a manner that allows it to interact with E. coli components like the thermos. Okay? So in terms of schematically, what's, what we're showing here is that you don't have functional equivalency or functional redundancy 
throughout a phylogenetic tree among modern organisms. So if the black bar represents E. coli, the green bar represents thermos, any of these evolutionary intermediates between the two works. You step outside here and you no longer have functional equivalency or functional uh, similarity and those don't work. Okay? So that, got, that gives us kind of the support for this notion of, well, how do we understand adaptation? How does adaptation occur in the lab when you otherwise have what is a very conserved protein? Okay? And so that's where a postdoc in the lab, Betul Kajar, comes in where she wanted to understand various aspects of adaptation. So for example, how does the past restrict our ability to design new biological partners and organisms? As well as, you know, how do gene networks affect the evolutionary trajectory of a whole organism? And the way she did this is exploiting an experimental regime called experimental evolution. And so this is work um, that, that Betul had help with from Lily Tran, who's a wonderful undergrad in our lab. And this idea is that we want to be able to exploit ancestral sequence reconstruction to understand adaptation. And the way that the tool does this in the lab is she'll, she'll take an ancient protein, okay? So essentially she's going back in time. So here we have just a simplified phylogenetic tree. She goes back in time, takes an ancient protein, and replaces the modern counterpart in a modern organism with the ancient protein, okay? And she'll then be able to watch how that ancient protein adapts in the laboratory inside of a living organism. Okay, so as I mentioned, the way that she's doing this is she's exploiting a regime called experimental evolution that most famously developed by Rich Lenski at Michigan State. And what this, what, what is done is you have, so this is bacteria, you have your genome inside of that bacteria, circular chromosome, you knock out the modern form of the gene, and you would insert the ancestral form of the gene, and then all you do is you, you grow this, modify this recombinant organism in the lab where each day you're doing serial dilutions so that you can allow this organism to adapt in a particular type of environment. Okay, again, it's, it's, we're exploiting this notion that in an ancient gene is going to be more appropriate to watch the adaptation of, it, of, of a protein inside of an organism then if you're just necessarily taking a modern home along, whereby shown on the previous slide that you don't necessarily have functional equivalency across modern organisms. Okay, so when she does this, it turns out that this bacteria is viable. Thank goodness, right? So we have a viable bacteria, but it's very sick, okay? Which is great because it sets the scenario to allow us to watch this bug adapt inside the laboratory where the only modification we've made to this organism is putting an ancient gene inside of it in place of its modern form. Okay, so here we have, this is the same tree, this is the EFTU tree, so it's this node right here, that's the ancient protein that was integrated into E. coli. So you'll notice that the, the, optimal, the binary melting temperature of that protein, it's very similar to the E. coli EFTU, okay? But just to give you perspective, out of about 400 amino acids, there are 21 amino acid differences between this protein here and the E. coli protein. And maybe if you, are catch up, if you caught on a couple slides ago when I was showing you the in vitro data, if you, there was a number next to this node right here, it said 75 about, so that protein right there only works at about 75% as efficient as the E. coli protein in the E. coli in vitro translation system. Okay, so just to trivialize kind of what Betul did over a year and a half, here you have E. coli genome. You have two uh, genes for EFTU, it turns out, tough A and tough B. What she did was she knocked out both forms of the gene and she inserted the ancient EFTU in place of the modern tough B gene. She has ironically named it Rip Van Winkle. We just call it Rip for short, which I think is actually really ironic because we're not letting it rest in peace. We're actually bringing it back to life. And so we have this ancient gene. It's inside of E. coli. And what we next do is we just watch the E. coli evolve. How does it adapt to having this ancient gene inside of it? Okay. First thing we did was we measured what the fitness value associated with having this ancient gene. 
Okay, so here's the strain that my tool uses. It's REL, acronym for Rich Linsky, actually. And so this fitness, by definition, relative fitness, this has a relative fitness of one. If we make a knockout of just one of the tough genes, one, just one of the EF genes, so tough A, we see a decrease in fitness to about 0.88. Same as if we individually knock out tough B. So now we just have tough A present in this E. coli. It also has a fitness value of about 0.88. So notice, though, then, when we replace the tough B, so it's a knockout of tough A, and we've replaced tough B with the ancient gene, we see an even greater decrease in fitness. Okay? And so what Bethel does in the lab is she just, as I said, she lets these things grow each day. They get serially diluted, and they reach back up to population saturation. And she does this again and again. And after a certain amount of time, what we can do is we can measure the fitness of those evolved or adapted E. coli. And the way that this is done is we use a neutral marker that uh, uh, colonies either turn pink or red. And we can compare them so we can take an evolved culture, evolved strain, and, and compare it to the ancestral form. And this gives us a fitness value so that we can compare what's going on as we're watching the E. coli evolve in the lab. Okay, so this is done in six flasks. Um, so they're evolved at 37 degrees in a minimal media, which is fairly common for particular types of studies with E. coli. And we're currently at over 2,000 generations, where each day it's in a type of media. This minimal media only allows 6.6 .6 generations to occur each day. So you can do the math there to how long this has been going on. Every 500 generations, we'll, we'll do a competition assay whereby we can determine what the fitness is of the evolving strains. Okay, so that's what's shown on this slide right here. So we have on the x-axis, we have generations, okay? So this is where we started. This is day one where we inserted the ancient, ancient gene in place of the modern gene. And here is the relative fitness to the wild type E. coli. And as you recall, so we have a fitness um, of, of about 7.8, uh, 0.78 here with the, when we put in the ancient gene. And what we notice what happens right away is that very quickly the E. coli adapt. Okay. Within a couple hundred generations, the E. coli have accumulated advantageous mutations that allow its fitness to come back up to about wild type level. And just to give you perspective shown in orange is when you take a wild type E. coli, let it evolve in, in, these, in this particular minimal media condition that we have. And we see here you do get a slight increase in fitness, but it's not a very large increase in fitness. And it certainly overlaps with the different uh, lineages that we have across the generations that we're using. Okay, so next we can ask, well, how is the E. coli adapting? How have they evolved? How have they responded to the environment? Yeah. Yeah from this right here, from generation zero. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to measure relative fitness. And that's one of the ways that you can present it. We present it as relative to wild type, though. Okay. Okay, so, um, so to understand what's going on in terms of how the E. coli are adapting, what we can exploit is whole genome sequencing technology. We do this every 500 generations. And here are the results of those analyses. Okay, now, I'm not a betting person, but I would have betted my career that we would see mutations in the EFTU gene as the E. coli adapted towards having this ancient gene inside of it, right? I just told you that there are 21 amino acids. These 21 amino acids cause, these 21 amino acid differences cause the ancient gene to be less optimal in terms of functionality in the E. coli system, okay? So why wouldn't E. coli simply accumulate mutations in the ancient gene? Well, luckily for me, I did not bet my career on it because it turned out in no lineages did the ancient EFTU gene suffer a mutation that converts it from one amino acid to another, a non-synonymous change, okay? Now, what is interesting, though, is so in four of the six lineages, 
we have a mutation in the promoter region of the EFTU. Okay? Not in the coding region, so you don't have non-synonymous changes in the coding region, but you do have changes in the promoter region of, that's driving the expression of the ancient gene. Okay? We're using wild type promoter, not an ancient promoter. All right, so what does this mean in terms of expression? So I need to give you perspective here. If we take wild type, so this is wild type E. coli, and we do quantitative PCR to measure transcript levels, and we use that as a relative fitness, okay? We can compare that to a scenario in which we knocked out the tough A gene, so just one of the EFTU genes is gone, but we keep wild type tough B. What we see here is we take a big hit in the transcript level, and we also take that hit I told you right in fitness, whereby the fitness decreases from 1 down to 0.88. Compare this to the genome in which you've knocked out. So this is the RIP genome. We've knocked out tough A. And in place of tough B, we have the ancient EFTU. Notice the transcript levels. They're way down. Okay? And of course, its fitness is down at 0.77. Now just to answer maybe some questions in your head, the ancient genes that we use, okay, when we infer ancient sequences, we're inferring ancient amino acid sequences, okay? We actually don't care what the ancient DNA sequence is. What that allows us to do is we can codon optimize our ancient genes for expression in different organisms. So this ancient EFTU is codon optimized for expression in E. coli, okay? So the gene sequence itself necessarily shouldn't be why we're seeing such low transcript levels in terms of how our inference process was. Maybe it's a statement about how well we code on optimize things, but it's not a statement about how we infer things. Okay. So the next thing that Betul did was she looked at these, uh, these different mutations in the promoter regions of the tough gene, and she looked at the transcript levels. Okay. So here is the, uh, the RIP ancestor, right, so this has transcript levels of, uh, relative transcript levels about 2%. And notice then for these four strains here, these four lineages, where we have mutations in the promoter, these all increase transcription, okay? They increase transcription somewhere between two to about five-fold, right? So we can argue then potentially that these particular mutations are allowing the E. coli to, to adapt whereby you have a suboptimal protein, but you're making more of that suboptimal protein, and therefore you can respond to this particular um, uh, niche pressure that we're putting on the E. coli. I don't know why my clicker's doing that, sorry. So next though, we have, we have two strains, right? So I said we have four strains that have a mutation in the EF promoter. Well, we have two strains that have also adapted but they, there's no mutation anywhere associated with the EF protein or the EF transcription levels. And so that's the RIP5 and RIP6 lineages. And shown here are the mutations that have occurred in those lineages. Okay? So in black, the mutation occurred in RIP5. In green, mutation in RIP6. And what's interesting is we have mutations occurring in the same genes, just different types of genetic mutations that are occurring in these same genes. So here we have NUSA, which is a, actually a transcription termination factor. You have a 27 base pair deletion in that gene in RIP5. Yet you have a premature stop codon in RIP6. Right? Same kind of mutation. Right? Somehow there's maybe an, ad, an advantage to having a truncated gene. Um, same with you have B here, which is an initiation factor. You have an early stop codon. And then you potentially, well, we have a non-synonymous codon change. But we don't know what the effects of that change are. Okay? It may be that it's a deleterious change, similar to what a premature stop codon could do. Again, we, we have another example there where we have the same gene being mutated twice in two different lineage, lineages in response to having an ancient gene in it. Okay, so kind of that, what, that, what this presents us with is, is, is a case where we have this burden put on us, whereby we have to lift this burden by demonstrating that these particular mutations are responsible for the adaptation of E. coli in response to having an ancient gene inside of it. So you recall from earlier in this presentation, EFTU 
is important in protein translation. It brings amino acylated tRNAs to the ribosome. What it also does is it binds to a lot of other proteins. Okay? In fact, EFTU has this huge protein-protein interaction network. And it's the hub of this protein-protein interaction network, whereby it's binding to actually about 100 different molecules. Okay? This one protein is interacting with 100 different molecules inside of the cell. And so curiously, when we look at what proteins are being mutated in RIP5 and 6, they are proteins that interact or are part of this interaction network with the FTU. Okay, so there's the NUS, the IMF. I didn't talk about this kinase here, um, as well as HUP-A. These are all proteins that are being mutated in these lineages. And in particular here, we have this NUS-A and this IMF. So these are the ones that are acquiring premature stop codons or large deletions out of them. So it begs the question of, well, what's going on here? If you know, we know that it, NUS and TUF interact, why is it that there's a selective advantage to getting rid of NUS when you have this ancient TUF inside of the cell? Right? So that's what a tool set out to understand. So here we're, lo we're looking at, on the y-axis, we have the change in fitness relative to wild type. On the x-axis, we start here. We have, here's our RIP ancestor for this particular lineage. Okay, right? So it takes a fitness hit of about 0.23, right? So the fitness is 0.77 total compared to wild type. And then here's, a, here's the strain that has accumulated a 27 base pair deletion in the NUS AG, right? Here's the fitness of that evolved strain right there. So it's actually just a little bit greater than wild type at this point. But notice then that the big change in fitness value between those two scenarios. Okay. So next, what we did was we just deleted that gene. Just get rid of the whole gene. Okay, We have a gene that has a big chunk of it has been deleted. Now let's get rid of the whole thing. Okay. You don't see a significant hit in fitness when you do that. Next, what you can do is you can take the same construct right here and you can recombinantly express a wild type NUS off of a plasmid. So just transform that strain with a plasmid that expresses wild type NUS gene. And what you see here is you take a very large hit in fitness. Okay, compare these two, you see that there's a large change in fitness. And notice on the flip side, we do the same experiment right here, but don't put in the wild type gene. Express, recombinantly express the NUS gene with that 27 base pair deletion. Okay? And you'll see then the flip in fitness that occurs. So presumably this is in response. So I actually, for, to give you some perspective, you, the tool has done the same experiment in the wild type um, E. coli, and you don't see this flipping of fitness. And so what that argues to us is that this NUS mutation, this NUS response, is actually in response to having an ancient EFTU gene inside of the E. coli. Okay? So, it's, 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 so it's interesting from our perspective, actually, that we're getting these different responses. And we don't know what all these responses are yet. So I should preface saying that we're still trying to figure out some of the molecular details associated with these other changes. But it is interesting that we're seeing two very fundamentally different responses. One is a change in transcription, and another is a change in the, 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 the reading frame of the protein. Okay? And then actually it plays into what, what I think is kind of a ridiculous debate in the field of molecular evolution right now. It's, it's, from my perspective, it's pedantic, but you have people arguing, what's more important for evolution? Is it gene regulation, or is it changes to protein coding genes, such as enzymes? Okay? And you'll get these people arguing, well, no, regulation is more important. No, 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 no. You want to change the catalytic efficiency of an enzyme or substrate specificity of enzyme. That's more important to evolution. When in reality, right, if you're a rational person, you say, no, no, it's both, right? There are lots of ways to adapt. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing both of those ways to adapt within our particular system by putting in this ancient gene. So we have this single protein replaced with about so the ancient EFTU protein in our case is about 500 million years old. 
Um, we have this decrease in fitness when we put this ancient gene in. And one solution to having this ancient gene is to alter the gene expression of this suboptimal hub of the protein-protein interaction network. Another response is to rewire the protein interaction network itself. Okay? So change the connectivity of these nodes in here. Okay, so that's where we're currently at. And, and what's interesting also from our perspective is that we're actually seeing a lot of this in the lab right now. Not, not only in our lab, but also in other people's labs too, where we're seeing adaptation by loss of function. So you're having beneficial null mutations occurring in organisms as they respond to new environments. And from our perspective, that's cool because we think that what we're seeing is we're seeing the mechanism of adaptation in the lab. We're not seeing the final product, right? So oftentimes if you're an ecologist, you go outside, you observe something, what you're observing is the final product of natural selection. You're not observing the process of selection over time. And so probably potentially what we could argue is that loss of function is an immediate adaptation, but it's not an optimal adaptation. Over time, you'll probably get beneficial accumulation of mutations. Okay, so that's currently where we stand with the experimental evolution. Um, next, let me just, I guess, spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about two other stories. Um, one of those stories is going to be this notion of our inability to know the truth in phylogenetics. Okay? Right? We can't, you kind of inhibited. You don't know when you build a tree, a phylogenetic tree, you don't know if that's right. Okay? There's kind of the joke is that you can either talk to God or you can build a time machine. That's the only way you'd know if a phylogenetic tree is correct. And so we can't actually do either of those in my lab. And so what we need to do is come up with an alternative model to do that. And so typically or historically what's done in the field is you do these computer simulations, okay? And the way that this computer simulation works is you start off with a single sequence, you mutate that sequence, at some point, you split that single sequence into two divergent populations, and you let that process proceed until you have a sufficient amount of phylogenetic diversity, whereby, in this case, so we started off with a single sequence. We now have four sequences that we've evolved through a computer simulation. We then would take those sequences, those four sequences, and we could do a couple things. We could either test our ability to recapitulate this phylogeny, or what we could do is put them into our algorithms to infer what the ancient sequences are here in the phylogeny, right? This is a simulation. We know what that sequence is. So what we can do is we can take these tip sequences here at the top of the tree, plug them into our algorithm, see if we can correctly infer that sequence, that sequence, and that sequence, okay? That's kind of all fine and dandy, except that the computer simulation really suffers because it doesn't incorporate what um, what is kind of fundamental to all ancestral sequence reconstruction studies, and that is functional divergence, okay? There's not functional divergence on that, on that, through that computer simulation. Now, there are ways to kind of, to fudge it in terms of getting functional divergence, but it's not true biological divergence. And so what we want to be able to do is, um, we want to be able to build a phylogenetic tree whereby we know the relationships of the sequences and we know the ancestral sequences themselves, right? In that sense, it's kind of like building a time machine because we know what happened in the past. And this is um, where we, we exploit a gene family called red fluorescent proteins. And uh, this is the technique that, that Ryan Randall in my lab uses. I don't need to go into it, I guess. Let me just skip it. Basically, though, what she's doing is she's taking a single protein, a single gene, and she's mutating that through random PCR mutagenesis. Okay take a single red fluorescent protein gene, mutate that through random mutagenesis, plate those variants out. So this is an example of a plate that she'll get. Um, you, so here's the parent function. The parent function is this nice red. You can see that we have a change in function here, so we're kind of losing the red color. Um, so here you have complete loss of function. Here you have actually a, a vector that's closed in on itself that doesn't have any of the variant fluorescent protein. And there you can actually see a variant right there that's changing color. Right? So there's a lot going on in this tree, and in this sense, we can kind of play God. We can determine what lives and what doesn't live. Okay? So we'll say, oh, we want to keep function the same, we'll pick that variant. Maybe we want new functionality, then we would pick that variant because it has a different phenotype. Okay? So she does this over and over. 
that at the end of the day, she's going to have sequences that are phenotypically divergent. And we can take those sequences, and we can infer what the ancestral states are, and we can determine whether or not we've correctly inferred the ancient sequences and phenotypes because we actually evolved that. So here is the phylogenetic tree that Ryan has developed. So she started off with a single gene, and here are all of the mutations and all of the divergence points that she's created just based on mutating this single gene. So there are literally hundreds of mutations that Ryan has accumulated through these experiments, okay? So here are actually, um, these are the bacteria expressing those different genes that Ryan's evolved in the lab. So she started off with a red fluorescent protein, and she evolved it to give rise to all of these phenotypes right here, okay? So we start off with red, we now, I mean, this is not a great picture, but we have orange, bright orange, we have green, we have blue, right? So we have all of these sequences down here at the tips of the tree, okay? We can take those sequences, plug them into our algorithms to infer what the ancient sequence is there, 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 all throughout this tree. And we can get a measure, we can benchmark our accuracy for ancestral sequence reconstruction because this is a synthetic laboratory built phylogeny. So when we do this, so here we have, we have the tips of the tree, so these are our 19 sequences. These 19 sequences can go into our algorithm and we can infer what the ancient sequence is at each one of these circles on the tree. Now it turns out, fortunately for us, that the majority of nodes are correctly inferred when we do this, okay? But there are some nodes that are incorrectly inferred. And I, I don't have time to go into um, what's going on in terms of the performance of different metrics. But what's nice about this is that we're starting to be able to get a quantitative measure for the performance of ancestral sequence reconstruction. And this is important. So just recently, actually, I was on an NSF panel in which 20% of the proposals proposed to do ancestral sequence reconstruction. Not one of those PIs had ever done ancestral sequence reconstruction before. So in that sense, it's a little scary that people that are proposing to do this method don't really have any experience in it, but yet it's also great from our perspective because it's, it's kind of legitimizing this, um, this method of, of how you can understand structure or function and evolutionary relationships by inferring ancient sequences. But just to sum up then, we have DNA-based analyses and parsimony-based, and if anybody's built phylogenetic trees in here besides Su Jin's lab, you will know what those terms mean. Um, I won't go over what specifically is going on. So let me just, um, I guess in three minutes here, try to wrap up. Um, so if you attended our faculty retreat three years ago now, I set up this scenario whereby we are studying um, the cause of gout in our lab. So gout is the buildup of uric acid. Uric acid is a very insoluble molecule, and we're trying to understand why humans are susceptible towards getting gout, and what are, what's the uh, like paleobiological evidence for um, the development of gout and understanding the phylogeny. And so just briefly, um, uric acid is the breakdown product of purine catabolism. Okay? And most organisms, so here are your purines. There is some, some amino acids will also be broken down into uric acid. But what's unique among apes and some other organisms like birds and reptiles, but not for the same reasons, what's unique among apes is that this is the end product right there, purine catabolism, uric acid. Most other organisms on Earth will convert the uric acid into something that's a lot more soluble, like ammonia or urea, and then just flush it right out. But not us. And the reason we don't do it is because our gene, so we, uh, the uricase gene, oh, I'm sorry. So uricase is the enzyme that converts highly insoluble uric acid into a product called 5-hydroxyisoburate. We don't have a functional form of that gene. We have a pseudogene for that gene, okay? The normal gene would have eight exons in it, but we have two premature stop codons, an exons 2 and exons 5. So we cannot encode a functional uricase enzyme. So what James Kratzer in my lab did was he collected uric acid, right? So what we do in the lab is we analyze sequences in a phylogenetic context. James collected sequences, built the phylogeny, resurrected ancient uric cases throughout this phylogeny. And what's shown here is, so these are mammals here, okay? I'm not sure you can read that. Shown in gray are the apes. So these are 
that apes don't have a functional enzyme, right? I mentioned it's a, it's a pseudogene in apes. Whereas these organisms do have a functional enzyme. Um, I don't have time to go through all this, but just the, you know, if you follow the magenta. So the magenta is an activity property associated with the ancient proteins. And what you see here is that as you go up the tree from the common ancestor of mammals towards apes, you greatly diminish catalytic efficiency of the enzyme. Okay? And so th there's all kinds of evolutionary implications as to why this is. I don't want to go into that. Um, but just know, so we have this really nice model. So we have a paper in Nature Structural and Molecular Biology right now where we think we've uh, elucidated some of the evolutionary mechanisms as to why you have um, killed your uricase enzyme. And it's related to the fact that you can actually convert fructose into fat when you build up uric acid. And so that would have been advantageous to our ancestral frugivorous apes. Um, but what we're showing here is, so here's stably transfecting human hep G2 cells. So these are liver cells with ancestral uricases, okay? So we can see here, so here's empty vector. Here's one of our ancestors. So this is the most ancient ancestor here, which is very active. This other ancestor is less active. And what you can see here is, sorry, is that you produce your, uh, you get uricase activity in these human cells if you have that ancestor 19 or ancestor 20. When you put in the human form, you don't expect it to work. And sure enough, it doesn't even when you replace the stop codons. Uh, these images are sim simply showing that uricase is going to the peroxisome where it exists functionally in other organisms. Um, what's kind of interesting is that what we can do is we can follow the accumulation of triglycerides. I know I skipped over the metabolic pathway that's going on here, um, but just know that uric acid stimulates production of triglycerides in the presence of fructose. And we can demonstrate that by taking these hep G2 cells, exposing them to fructose, okay? So here's the empty vector. Here's having ancestral uricase 19, which was a very active uricase. And we just follow triglyceride production in the presence of increasing fructose. And notice what happens is, if you have a uricase present, a functional uricase present, you diminish triglyceride production. Same thing kind of happens with the other ancestor that's not nearly as active, but right, remember it's not as active, so you don't expect it to work as well. And sure enough, it's not as good at preventing triglyceride production as the very active ancestor 19. Okay, I'll just, I'll skip over this. Um, so lastly, we have interest in being able to develop a therapeutic. So it turns out for reasons I won't go into that there's a therapeutic value of this ancestral uricase. Um, and because of that, we have actually, so we've done rodent studies. I won't go into that. I guess I'll just end with the fact that um, we've, we've, we've a, a nice side story that's anecdotal that's amusing to me is, so James was funded by the Tiger program here at Georgia Tech. The Tiger program pairs up PhDs in engineering and sciences along with MBA students in the College of Management along with JD students at Emory Law School. And what they do is they try to develop companies, startup companies, off of the technology that the PhD student is developing. And so we were able to do this, so we were funded by Tiger. And what we've been able to do with our results and our development is we've been able to parlay that into funding from the Peter Thiel Foundation, something called Breakout Labs, okay? So for those of you that don't know Peter Thiel here, on the left, he co-founded PayPal with Elon Musk. Right, Elon's a lot more famous for developing rockets and spaceships and electric cars. What Peter does with his money is he invests it in the startup companies. Most famously, there's a scene in the social network where Zuckerberg and Sean Parker are in Peter Thiel's office. Peter Thiel's the first investor in the, in the Facebook. He invested $500,000. He cashed out at $1.1 billion. Okay, I haven't told Peter this, but I'm not going to make him that much money, all right? But what we'd hope to be able to do is, is parlay subsequent TL money into money from other sources to further develop this company that we have that's in the incubator of ES&T. So um, with that then, I need to, to, to thank the funding sources. So we've received fellowships from CD4, as well as the Georgia Research Alliance. We had a fellowship from the Georgia Research Institute. 
School of Biology for um, the startup money. Uh, as Julia mentioned, NSF money. Uh, Megan Cole was a postdoc for the NIH in the lab. We've been very fortunate to have a fair amount of NASA funding. Most recently, DuPont uh, named a, uh, awarded us with a Young Professor Fellowship. So with that, I apologize. Uh, so not very much time for questions, but if you have to go, feel free to go. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer those for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. With, yeah, there's a huge value in doing that, actually. Um, you know, we're not an army, so we're kind of limited in what we do. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I just told you I was not a betting person, but and I told you why I was not a betting person. Um, you know, it, biology is amazing, right? There, it, 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 Biology responds in an infinite number of ways sometimes. And I could imagine it going either way in terms of how it responds to having an ancient promoter inside of it. We've actually done some ancient promoter work with a transposon, um, for a particular transposon that are in, in lower vertebrates. And we've shown how that influences transcription. Um, but yeah, I could go either way. It's a, it would be a great experiment to do. Patrick? Yep. Versus, yeah, right, again, I mean, so Batola will have a career out of dissecting the system, right? So she can certainly, she can introduce those individual mutations within the background of the ancestral state versus the strains that have increased expression to see how that plays out in terms of whether or not it's adaptive in particular genetic backgrounds or whether, I mean, sometimes they're probably even neutral. Um, so, but yeah, that's, that's something that we'd like to be able to do. But, yeah, John. Um, well, these are individual clones that we make the construct from, yes. I mean, maybe when, we, when, when the knockout and knock-in experiments were done, that was a population. But what we select is a single. Yep. Starting population, yeah. Yeah, so what we don't talk about, is, and I kind of cheat when I give this presentation, is that we have what's called a mutator strain. So a mutator strain is when E. coli adapts by increasing its mutation rate. And so what we could do is we could go off in a direction with the mutator strain to see, is the mutator strain just accumulating the same mutations faster, or does it allow the that, that strain to sample sequence space differently because it's occurring faster. Yeah. Yeah, of course, right. Yep. Yeah. But that's not always the case, actually, with experimental evolution. Uh, Roger, last question. An ancient organism. I don't know what that. Yeah, yeah. So when you look at the melting profile of that ancient protein, it's it's the, the same as E. coli. Oh, um, yeah. So we we have casually tried for a different protein family, uh, MREB, that we have. That's a that was mutated in our, in our strains, is we've been trying, so there are, 
non-synonymous mutations in MREB, and kind of preliminarily what we've tried to do is build a, a, a phylogeny of MREB proteins and infer the ancestor to see if MREB is reverting to its ancestral state in response to having an ancient EFTU inside of the E. coli. And that was not the case for that particular gene. Theory. But that would be the kick-ass result. Yeah. Well, on that, All right. thank you. Thank you.